Hi, everybody. This is the next next episode of Shift and Podcast, and we have a special guest, Greg Young, with us today. He is, um, in my opinion, one of the one of the best software architects uh, right now in the world, uh, because he's not only the author of a um, quite interesting concept of software architecture, but also, as far as I understand, the person who writes code quite actively every day. So I would love to talk to him today about writing code and managing other people writing code and then software architecture in general. So Greg, could you please say a few words about yourself? What do you do right now? What do you work on? Well, let's see. This morning, I was actually working on finishing something I started a couple of years ago and just had kind of left off. So it's a, a client for event store written in C. The cool thing about it being in C is that obviously you can use it from pretty much anywhere. So you, you actually code in C right now? Um, I, I've coded in C regularly for coming up on 20 years. <laughs> is it C or C++? Nope, straight C. Why not C++? I'm just trolling a little bit, but still. Um, well, w one, when I write C++, I have a tendency of writing C and C++. Um, I've just never gotten that far into C++. Two, for me, the having of a C client is actually much more valuable than a C++ client because it can be used in essentially anything. Um, what if I were to have a 68040? Do you think I could compile my C code down for 68040 and get it working? <laughs> What about my C++ code? Ooh, well, maybe. Let's talk about what compilers we might be looking at. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it, it, the whole reason I've been playing with the C client, and it's not, this isn't any serious work. This is just, you know, it's me playing around, um, has been that it would be one client that can be used from essentially anywhere. And you know, we jumped, we decided to do this talk, this interview after I met your tweet out of many other tweets you make, but this one got me very interested and um, let me actually quote it. Well, you're saying there that you are not happy with people, uh, more and more people saying that they are CTOs, chief technical officers, but they don't code and you don't find this trend, you find this trend scary. So why it's scary? What's wrong with that? Well, I, I, I've worked as a consultant for many years. And I've been to many organizations where I go and talk to a chief technology officer and, well, they literally don't know how to code. And it's very, very difficult to be in such a position without having understanding of code. Um, so we are going to be telling people to do things and we are setting direction, but we are incapable of looking at the work that's being produced. We're it's incapable everywhere. of knowing the quality of the work that's being produced. <laughs> it's everywhere. I mean, I've never met in my life, I've never met anyone at the position of the CTO who would actually write code because they know how to code, some of them but they don't do it every day. They, they've done it a long time ago, maybe when they were programmers, but when they are CTO, they don't even think about that. So I, I think there's a happy mix where you end up with a CTO who's actively looking through code and who occasionally sends pull requests but isn't necessarily spending, you know, six hours a day actively writing code. But they should at least have some basis in writing code. And it's not that they wrote code 20 years ago. It's that they, they still know how to actively write code. Um, being a CTO and not getting into the code of your teams is actually quite difficult. I mean, what, what are you basing things off of if you're not in that code? Are you just going off of what they say? 
Yeah, that's true. You know what they say, because I have a few friends, a few people who I know quite close who are CTO. And when I ask them this question, do you really code? They say we do more high level things because coding is something uh, other people can do. That's the very typical answer they give. And I'm not suggesting that CTO should be coding six hours a day. It's more seeing a pull request from a CTO should be a fairly normal thing. Even if it's not something important, it's, you know, they were just looking through some code and well, they, they saw this function and they wanted to refactor it. So they sent a pull request for it because it, it came out a little bit nicer after refactoring it. So they have to look at the code. They have to once upon a time, go to the repository, check what's going on there. So they have, it has to be in their agenda, in their everyday uh, routine work. Not Correct. just attending meetings, right? Not just talking to people, but actually opening the repository, going through the code and well, making if some... You, if you're not doing that, then what are you basing everything on? I don't know. And well, look, I, I'm not at all suggesting that, you know, a CTO should be coding 30 hours a week or... But they should at least have familiarity with the code base. And do you think in general coding is uh, an art, something which is creative, or it's more like a manufacturing process? I would definitely have to go with art on that one. There are some pieces of code that you will come into that there's lots of well-known ways of handling it. And you're basically just going to be following the same pattern that you've used 50 times before. But once we start looking at systems in general, it, it doesn't really fall down that because you start getting into like, okay, so we're going to do microservices. Okay, how are those microservices going to talk to each other? What are those patterns going to look like? Where are my boundaries? And this suddenly starts getting into much more. And this is art. That is approaching art. I mean, you're still following patterns. Um, am I going to use events or am I going to use uh, direct communications in a request response way? I mean, th there's patterns that are being applied here but overall, it's much closer to a form of art than to a mechanical process. You know, some say that we have 20 million programmers in the world right now. It's hard to believe that we have 20 million artists to me. Oh, you might be surprised how many terrible artists there are at home. <laughs> they, 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 they come home and they paint and you just never hear about them. <laughs> yeah, you make a point. Good point. <laughs> and, and, and this about the design patterns you mentioned. I, I was recently um, discussing the design patterns in general with a few students, and I found out that uh, some people believe that design patterns are actually a good thing, and there are books about that, so recommending people how to, how to design stuff using the patterns. And at the same time, there is a... Uh, there's another group of authors who say that design patterns actually make programming more routine and, and because of that, more we duplicate more code because we, we do the same over and over again and that leads to the code duplication. What's so your take so on that? For, for me, the main benefit of design patterns really has nothing to do with code. For me, the main benefit of a design pattern is I can use some words to describe a concept and you understand me. If I were to say that I think we should use an abstract factory around the creation of this object, you would go, oh, okay. Now, whether or not we actually end up implementing it in that way is a whole secondary discussion. But just going back and forth between you and I, we just, talked about something that was relatively complex and we did it in one sentence. 
when you start seeing things in code and they happen to be following design patterns, you can kind of normally see it and be like, well, I think I know what this is doing without going and looking further into it, but I should still probably look further into it just in case. So it's like it's, a vocabulary for us, right? Yeah. Um, if you see a foo singleton, I'm willing to bet that you're going to guess that there's only one instance of it. Right. So we need to teach young programmers these design patterns and give them full, you know, full full amount of them because there are many of them, not not ten, not right. maybe maybe hundreds. Well, and even. it's it's building up vocabulary of well-known solutions to common problems where communication is going to happen better between people. Instead of me having to drop class diagrams of how we're going to do this, I can say we're going to follow something similar to this pattern. And everyone goes, oh, okay. What about these people saying that patterns lead to duplication? Do you, do you understand what, they're, what they mean by that? Yes, um, there, there are some patterns that can lead to duplication. Like, let's say, yeah, let's say there's a singleton. So you learn about singleton and then you see a singleton here, singleton there, singleton there. So you make three singletons and it looks to you as you're a programmer, it looks to you easier because you know singleton. So you put it in all the places, but at the same time, you over and over re-implement uh the same concept which probably could be replaced by something else and, and extracted to some one place and then instead of having three singletons you're going to have one place with something which uh, is... we're getting we're getting into one of my favorite topics now which is code duplication right and the, the reason it's one of my favorite topics is i have a rather controversial view on it i like code duplication huh so one of the things that i hate is coming into a code base where everything is connected to everything and then you have to make a change to this base thing and you realize it's going to affect 3,428 other places. And you're like, holy crap, what is going to happen if I do this? <laughs> and I, I've, I've argued online before that one of the things we should be looking at more is, is to try denormalizing our code to reduce dependencies. Interesting. And I know that, that that's completely in the face of what everybody actually recommends, which that's is right. that we normalize our code. Right. But there's some benefits to denormalizing your code as well. Have you ever gone and worked on, let's say a thousand line self-contained piece of code? What's self-contained? Self-contained, no dependencies on anything. It's just a thousand lines of code, top to bottom. And it's beautiful because yes. you can make it do whatever you want and right. you can go change anything that you want. Right. So it's, well, these libraries, frameworks, so you think they make code less understandable? They absolutely do. How many times have you had a bug in your framework? Yeah, many times. And then it, or something that was non-intuitive or, and you end up in the weeds for eight hours trying to figure out how to get your framework to do this. When, if you just had code in front of you, it'd be like, this is 10 minutes. Right. And I'm not saying that one way is right and the other is wrong. I'm saying that we've been over-optimizing to one side and that's the normalization side. So denormalization is like looking at the library and saying, okay, I don't need to have the library. I just need this piece of functionality from the library. So I take it from the library, extract it, put it into my code, use it, maybe modify it a little bit, but now I have it inside my code and I know what it does. And this is the denormalization. Why not? It's interesting. Never thought about that. And it, this doesn't apply for all code, obviously but it's a relatively common experience to run into where it's like, no, huh. I'm just gonna copy and paste this code out of that into my code and move forward. 
And now I have no dependency on what anyone does to that code in the future. I have no dependency on that library. I have no, that's my code. Maybe we can have it in the computers, like some plugins, some AI maybe, which can suggest us to do that. Maybe the AI can, I mean, computer, whatever, can look at our code yeah. and say, you're overusing the library because you're, you depend on a huge library where you need basically just one function out of it. So how about you take it from there, put it here, and then your code becomes more readable. Absolutely. And there, there's another side of this, which a lot of people don't think about, which is security. Right. So when I have dependency on that whole library, I also have dependency on all of its vulnerabilities. Hmm. Whereas when I took the 100 lines of code out of the 50,000, I now have dependency on those 100 lines of code. And it, I want to be very clear, this is not a, I should always do this. It's, well, how much of that stuff am I actually using? And you'd be amazed how often you take a dependency on this massive thing, and then you use the equivalent of 100 lines of code out of it. Hmm. Right. That's a good point. So do you really do that in your code, like this denormalization, or it's just a theory? Oh, no, no, no. I, I've used this kind of denormalization for a very, very long time. And then your code becomes longer, right? It's more readable, but longer, just like you said, the 1,000 lines. Okay. And a, a big part of why I started doing it was my background at the time. I used to work in embedded systems. In embedded systems, this is completely freaking normal to do because we, we are loading on to a very small device. So if I can cut 6K off of my image, that's a win. Mm -hmm. We, we got to the point where we had basically filled our EEPROMs. So now anytime you want to make a change, you had to worry about whether or not it would fit on the EEPROM after you made the change. EEPROM? What, what is that? Oh, uh, EEPROM is a, a chip that goes onto oh, yeah. the board that you, you basically have your code on. Think of it as like a, an electronics storage system. Mm -hmm. Um, some of them are rewritable. Some of them are not rewritable. It's basically, uh, your code is going on a chip. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have disks or anything like that. Uh, maybe a good analogy in a PC might be you were writing BIOS. Mm -hmm. When you're writing BIOS, you put it on a chip and it goes on the board. Mm -hmm. Most embedded, I shouldn't say most embedded systems, ma many embedded systems are EEPROM based. Mm -hmm. And what about um, unit tests? If you believe in unit testing, I don't know. That's probably my first question to you. Do you believe in unit testing in maybe test driven development as well? So, have you ever seen Mighty Moose? Seen what? Mighty Moose. Mighty Moose, no. Mighty Moose is a product I created some time ago. Uh -huh. uh, it was fine. And basically what it would do is it would figure out which unit tests needed to be run when you changed code. Oh. So if you change some code, it would figure out that these are the unit tests that could possibly be affected and then run those unit tests. I've been writing unit tests for a very, very, very long time and writing tooling on top of it. <laughs> Um, I am a strong believer in writing unit tests and integration tests. Um, and you know the difference? Absolutely. Can you explain? <laughs> uh, scope. Uh, how many things am I interacting with? And if I'm interacting with three things, is it the unit test or inter integration test? I would need to look at the code in question because there, there are some times where I might be calling a method on an object and internal to that object, it then uses another object internally. 
-huh. In which case, I would say that's that looks more like a unit test. Mm -hmm. But it's more likely to end up being an integration test. A perfect example of the former might be I am calling a method on a customer object. And inside of that method, it's uh, interacting with a name value object and with an address value object. Mm -hmm. So we have three objects there, but that's absolutely a unit test. So there is not a clear line between unit testing and integration testing still, because you mentioned three things I, I touch. And let's say there are three things and I touch a file. Well, the, the general line for me is if we were to look at DDD as an example. So I have unit tests on my aggregate, but inside of my aggregate, I might have many objects inside. Yeah. So when you test so this I look at it as one concept, the aggregate, if that kind of makes sense. Yes, definitely. And now let's try to write a unit test for this concept. It's going to be a unit test or integration. That's going to be a unit test. Although mm -hmm. I, I have a, a much more useful way of, of putting this. Uh, and I, I've used this definition for many years, which is, is this fast or is this slow? If it's fast, then it's a unit test. If it's slow, then it's an integration test. Hmm. Again, quite difficult to give a specific definition of slow and, and fast. Um, fast for me is it runs in one or two milliseconds. Mm -hmm. um, so th this is more a, a definition based on use than a definition that is actually useful. Mm -hmm. Because you could write something that touches 500 objects and it can be fast. Right. <laughs> what I'm looking for there is more, my unit tests I intend to be running on a very, very regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, hell, with Mighty Moose, it was every time you saved your code, all your tests were wrong. Mm -hmm. So I want that to be fast. And that's very, very important to keep fast. Then I have a bunch of tests which might still be highly valuable, but they're slow. I just don't want them being run every time that I change my code. <laughs> Because because your your entire test suite is slow, right? You, that's why you created the system in order to run only specific tests because the full test suite is too slow. Well, and it, it all comes down to value. So my fast tests they they run really 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 quickly, and they tell me what things are broken. I basically want to optimize for them to run as fast as possible and to tell me as much stuff is broken as possible. My other tests, they are more focused on quality. They're focused on, I have not made drastic mistakes that might go forward. If that kind of makes sense? Yeah. They are not fast. They take a long time to run, perhaps, maybe an hour. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm looking between the two of those, and I'm trying to optimize for my workflow. If all my tests run in 10 seconds, that's no problem. If my tests take 15 minutes to run while I'm sitting there actively developing code, I'm not going to run them. Do you really have tests which go for 15 minutes? Uh, I, I, I have had tests that take days. Really? I mean, uh, the integration test. More, I was going to say, this is more when you start getting into things like what about elections in event store? What about it? 
So we, we have elections that run. How do you test that the election algorithm actually works properly? So we're going to need to throw up a couple nodes, like fake nodes. And then what we're going to do is we're going to throw in randomized failures between them. And then we're going to let it run for a while. Right. And because of the way things works, you, you have timeouts, you have all these other things that can occur. That, that we literally had nodes sitting doing elections for days. Another good example of a test that can take days, but I'm going to take days and I'm going to turn it into months for you. How do you know that the data is actually on disk? After like making a file, creating a file or? No, it's something like event store. You do a write. Yes. It comes back to you and says, okay, you're right. You're all good. Is that data on disk right now? It's a good question. I would do something through the operating system and check on the file system and check it, you know, like a, around my software and check what's going on there. That's not good enough. So what you end up needing to do and pretty much every database company has done this at some point is we're going to set up clients that are, are doing writes and they're tracking what's been told to them by the database. Okay. And then what we do is we pull the power on that node and plug it back in. When it oh. comes back up, then they verify everything that they've been told is actually correct. So you kind of crash this recovery. Check and, we, and we will do this 10,000 times. Oh. Oh yeah, because one time may not guarantee that the next time we really gonna. You, you to might you might have just gotten lucky and the, and the buffers had just been cleared at right when you pulled power. So you need to do it time and time and time and time and time again. If you go on the event store website, and this might be a fun one to pull up uh, with pictures of it, uh, just for people listening, there's actually a blog post with pictures of our power pull clusters. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Huh. But I'm not even sure if I would call that an integration test at that point. That's more. It's more like non-functional properties test. It's like quality of service test because you don't really test yeah. the functionality. You test like how it is resilient to, to failures. I don't know, something like that, right? Well, and what's fun with it is you're not just testing the software. Big part is you're also testing the hardware. That's right. <laughs> the whole system, actually, the file system, operating system, your software, how they get together. But it is important. I totally get it. Maybe it, even more important than functionality tests. Well, and what's funny is that was literally one of the most important tests we were running. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> What, what happens if your database loses data during a power outage? Yeah, right. You'd be rather miffed about this entire thing. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. And But this is more like for system software, right? I mean, I totally get the purpose. I'm just thinking how it's applicable to other, like most software products people develop right now. Because I think most people don't do system development. They do more, more like right. on the level of applications, right? Like mobile application, for example. You don't test right. that. Right. And this this would not work very well on like a random mobile app. Right. Um, but this is the same kind of testing I used to do a lot in a company that I worked in early in my career where we were doing embedded systems. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that kind of testing is randomized testing. I want to see if I can make a break. The nice thing about this kind of testing is once you've been off running in that environment for a while, simulating real failures, making sure you come back from them properly, et cetera, et cetera, you have a fairly high level of confidence when you go to put this thing into production. We forced it to fail 27,000 times and we were able to recover from it 27,000 times. The chances of having one failure in production and it taking us down are relatively low. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And how do you control this power on, power off? So you, you have to connect your software with some power switch, which is programmable. 
it, it, we actually have these. Uh, they sell them. So basically what it is, is it's a little box that sits between the electrical outlet and the computer. And you basically plug it into the electrical outlet, and then you plug the computer into it. And it has a network connection, and you can, I, I've seen varying ones. Some of them are HTTP, some of them are TCP. And you can basically send an HTTP post to it, telling it to turn off power outlet two. Then you can send another HTTP post to it, turn on Power Outlet 2. Cool. So you made this hardware as well for testing? No, 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 no. Oh, you, we, you bought it. People sell this. Okay. There's people that sell this out there. Um, it, you could also do something uh, like an X10 interface. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that we picked up, we, we picked up because they support HTTP, which was just kind of nice as opposed to having to deal with X10 or something like that. But there's quite a few of these kinds of tools that exist out there, and they're not very expensive. And they have a load of uses outside of what we're discussing. Um, consider, for instance, if I were going to be running a restaurant. And one of the things in my restaurant was I had a big television-based menu system that was all over the restaurant. Mm -hmm. Well, if I plugged it in with all of these in order to shut everything off, I could just do it right from the cash register, right? Mm -hmm. So when I say close out, close out turns off all the TVs. Okay. As opposed to making somebody walk around hitting the power buttons on all of them. Right. And it's especially true at some place like a McDonald's where these screens are often embedded in the wall. And you might not easily be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. And um, uh, next question, which I wanted to ask you about test-driven development. So uh, do you believe in that? Do you believe in writing tests before writing code? Because many people say that test-driven development is sort of dead. So people don't use it. So it was a good concept 20 years ago, but no more. We actually uh, write code for blah, blah, blah. So I, I think the main value of TDD does not necessarily come from writing the test first but there's a massive amount of value in writing the tests. Now, one thing I have found is that especially in younger developers, writing the test first actually helps a lot. Really? Younger? Yes, because they, they don't necessarily have the clear form of what they want to build in their head yet. If that kind of makes sense? Yes, yes, yes. So showing from the outside, this is how I intend to use this thing, and then moving to the inside to actually make it work actually helps quite a bit. But when you have a solid idea of what that thing inside is already going to look like, you get far less value from writing the test first. You still get the value of having the test over time, although there's better ways of doing that. But in general, you think tests are necessary because again, there are people who are saying that tests in general uh, it's a like flawed idea that uh, it only takes our time and then these tests just go away because the code moves faster than the test, so tests cannot catch up. So we throw them away and then just they're just like well, burdens it, staying in the repository. It, you, have to, you have to remember, I am a fairly big fan of theorem-proofed languages. Now, with theorem-proofed languages, when you go to write a test, my compiler is going to tell you that it's going to fail. Mm -hmm. So there's literally no value in you having written that test. You should be focused on your contracts. That said, most of us are not working in those environments today. Yeah, that's my question. What kind of language are you talking about? Oh, a good one would be spec sharp. Okay. You literally write 
contracts on something where I would say, for instance, this argument must be greater than or equal to zero and less than the size of the array that's being passed in. And it will be proven that anywhere that calls this will have made sure this is true. It's like designed by contracts paradigm. It, it, it is absolutely designed by contract. Mm -hmm. But it's designed by contract with theorem prover running over it. It's even stronger approach. Well, it's basically that when you write your contracts, I will not allow you to call something that you have not proven that you meet the contract of. We don't have this stuff in Java, C Sharp, and all that modern languages, right? Python. No, no, no. Spec Sharp. Spec Sharp was a, and we're talking. This this goes back a decade. So Spec Sharp was a version of C Sharp that supported this, and it came with a theorem prover, which was named Boogie. And Boogie would would actually go through and theorem prove your C Sharp code. Now, interestingly, SpecSharp did not really move forward. It, it kind of like went off on a side path, but quite a few things out of the prover and the general idea of what they were doing did actually come into the language. Mm -hmm. So th there are things that are not nearly as much, but there are things which are today returned as compiler errors in C-sharp, which were not previously. And so you can this, do this based on annotations, et cetera. So this checker is the checker, I assume. So this checker runs after I, I type my code in or while I type my code in. Um, so it, it's, it can do both. So basically, it's just part of the compiler pipeline. So it, it's the same as if you're typing code. And if you haven't finished a type name, it turns red, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you mistype a type name, it'll turn red. This works in roughly the same way because it was actually built into the compiler. Mm -hmm. So you're basically just getting compilers for the things that aren't meeting your contracts. It's powerful. But it seems that if this is not on the market right now or not very popular. It seems that programmers are not very happy about these contracts. They probably would like to have more freedom and write whatever they like. Well, the big problem is different types of code need different levels of formality. So in something like implementing large parts of event store, this would have been very, very valuable. Implementing an ASP.NET page for your mom's pet store, it would not be so valuable. And it would probably take you longer to write that little ASP.NET page using such a thing right. and different types of code bugs have very different costs associated with them in a lot of places it, having a bug it's like <clears throat> okay we, we lost three dollars and in other places having a bug it, is a million dollar penalty and still, this is where people don't use this design by contract, to my experience. You, you see a lot of these types of formal proving occurring in things like, I need to build an aircraft control system. No, oh, I know. A it. bug here might be rather expensive. Yeah, I can imagine. What's been interesting is that they, the ideas have been coming out into more general software. Uh, another thing that you'll find here is, for instance, modeling things as state machines versus modeling them as typical procedural code. Because 
I can actually prove a state machine. Have you ever had to do this? No, not in my real life. No, not in real projects. <laughs> <laughs> I just know it exists, but ask like any random regular programmer and I don't know, in any company, they would say, no, we don't even know what you're talking about. I know Java, I know objects, methods, classes, singletons. <laughs> well, I, I had actually looked at writing a language, which was rather specifically around some messaging concepts, in particular dealing with things like process managers, where you would write top-down code and basically you could use join. So I, I need to await on something or I need to join awaiting multiple things. And your top-down code would actually produce a state machine. Uh -huh. And the whole reasoning for producing the state machine is that if I limit your language to what I can produce into that state machine, I can formally verify your code. And then after you verify my code, what happens? You're going to raise some exceptions. You're going to, uh, your, your analyzer are going to complain, not let my code go to production. What happens? I'm going to give you a compile error that this will fail at runtime. Oh, so it's sort of like a static anal analysis, which is happening. Right. All right. So I found that you told me this process manager should complete within 15 minutes. I found a path because it's represented as a state machine where it might take 18 minutes. Here's the messages that would take you along that path. Mm -hmm. Right, and that will stop programmers from writing the code, which is broken potentially. Well, that may, you wouldn't be physically possible of compiling code that wouldn't work. You know you how me it should work this way. <laughs> if, if it doesn't work that way, you, you cannot compile it. <laughs> you know how many people I met who are saying and believing that static analysis is a bad idea, that uh, preventing people from writing the code they would like to write it is a bad idea. They're saying like, we should let programmers do whatever they like and, and, and then let the, see the code in production and, and the long story after well, that. And again, this depends on the type of code that we're discussing. There is a huge amount of code that this is completely fine to allow to happen. With. Things like process managers, not so much, because when you have a process manager go out to lunch, there's a direct cost associated to that. Yeah. I, I would much rather know that my process managers actually terminate and are guaranteed to terminate and are guaranteed to terminate within a given SLA than to have to run all the monitoring, et cetera, associated with them to be able to track whether or not we've actually had an issue. What would you say to a programmer, let's say in your team, who just joined your team and finds out that you have so many uh, control system in place, which does the checks, which you just explained. And the programmer says, it's quite annoying because I write the code. I, I try to push it through to the product, you know, to the, to the pipeline and I get mistakes. I get errors. I can't complete my tasks. So it's very annoying for me. I don't like yeah, 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 yeah. I, I've got a, a really, really good statement to have in that conversation. That's probably not going to be a conversation in the office. That's probably going to be a conversation after work with a beer. And it's going to be, so I want you to stop and think for a minute, what happened, what would happen if you didn't get those error messages and you were instead having to deal with that same problem, but it occurred in production? It stopped you from being able to push it because there was a possible error that could happen in production if, you, if it happened. But you understand that this is extra work for programmers to go through all these checks. It, it is, and you get accustomed to it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But I would much rather have you get a compiler error than for you to have 40,000 separate 
Process managers all go out to lunch at the same moment. And now, how are you going to correct those 40,000 things that were running? Are you going to go edit state variables by hand? So you would try to convince programmers to, you would try to encourage them to believe that this is something they, that we all need to have this extra test, this extra validations, um, in order so, to. I, I, I've done this in the past. And what my main thing that I focused on in order to even justify it was what happens when these things do go wrong? And it's, oh my God, this is a nightmare. And who do you blame in this case? The programmer who makes the mistake or the programmer who didn't implement the check or who is at fault when something goes wrong with the production? What well, do you do we, we, could, we could also say that maybe it was QA. Maybe it was... My worry is not associating blame to somebody. My worry is ensuring it doesn't happen. I would much rather just have this be impossible to happen. Even if it, you know, you're gonna you're gonna have to spend a day or two to kind of learn how this thing with the joint calculus actually works. Mm -hmm. But then we never have this happen in production. Our risk is gone. And again, it's not the situation where one of these processes goes off the rails that I'm worried about. It's when there's 500. Mm -hmm. One process going off the rails, it's, okay, you know what? Manual intervention, we're, we're going to have customer service handle this one that went off the rails and no big deal. When there's 500 of them, this is a completely different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. But all that we're trying to really prove here is that we have this process. This process starts with X. And these are the termination points of, these, of this process. And all that we're going to try to prove is that we reach a termination point. Not that it's always successful, just that we reach a known termination point. We have not gone out to lunch. Right. And don't you think that it's time to blame not people for the mistakes we have on production, but programming languages, which we have now? Just because of no. them, we have so many bugs. Because of the design of the languages, which in my opinion, the design, well, okay, in, in the opinion of some people, it's the languages which are super flexible, which allow programmers to make whatever they want. For example, having the I don't know, procedure, block of code without contracts and so on and so forth. And because of that, most programmers don't just use it and code production systems, just like this, uh, like you explained, ASP.NET, Mama page. Okay, so many, many years ago, I used to work as an electrician. And we had an expression back then that is very applicable here. A craftsman never blames his tools. It's a good one, but still, you know, if you're a craftsman, craftsman, then yes, you have an experience of 20 years, then of course you don't blame your tools. Tools, But most programmers, remember, there are 20 million of them, and most of them are not craftsmen. They are like junior programmers who don't know how to, to use Java or C++ or C in the right way. So they right, just but take now, it. now we're at the point of talking about an electrician who's using a butter knife to take apart a light socket. Exactly. And is complaining that his butter knife doesn't work very well. It's like, well, what you need to do is you need to learn how to use a screwdriver. And I'm not trying to take a piss out of them or something like that, but it's a lot of the stuff that we see today is not problems with the tools, it's problems with the people using them. So you think there is no room for improvement of the modern programming languages which we have? So you're happy with the languages? Well, I think fear improving is one major one. But 
I don't think new language features are, for the most part, going to fix a lot of the issues that people are facing. Well, if you embed this theorem proving into modern programming languages, then I believe it will fix a lot of things. If compilers yeah, there, will... There's a big problem with that, in that when we're talking about having a junior developer out working in this code, the same junior developer is writing the contracts as is writing the code. Yeah, that's true. So the, the contracts are likely about as valid as that code is. <laughs> so you're saying that the languages we have right now are very easy to, to use and uh, very easy to make mistakes with, but it's like a trade-off, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a good trade-off for some types of code, and it's a bad trade-off for other types of code. I can assure you, you would much rather go write an implementation of Paxos in a formally proven environment than trying to write it in JavaScript. But very few people do that. Correct. But there's lots of code that kind of fits this pattern. Um, a lot of domain models actually fit this pattern very, very well. and. We're even taught today to do things to reduce scope inside of domain models. Let me give a perfect example. Value objects. Value objects are immutable, correct? Right. And all validation of that value object happens within the constructor when you're building it up. Yeah. So now I can carry this thing around and I can assume things about it. It's the same type of thing. And it's good. What I'm, I'm limiting the scope of things that could possibly happen coming off of it. What if I could give more information about that value object that the compiler would be able to check? Like what? Oh, let's just say that we had a positive money value object. And then you wrote an if statement that was checking if it was negative, that then you should go and do these things. Uh, and the right. compiler were to tell you that thing can't be negative. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So the object will go around the code bringing constraints together with it. And the compiler right. will know these constraints. Uh -huh. Nice. Well, and it's not just the object. It, it's methods themselves have constraints on them. So I, I have said that when you call my function, I must be greater than or equal to zero, and I must be less than or equal to the length of this array. So now if I call something else, that comes forward. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Basically what it ends up doing is it ends up removing these repetitive if statements that are all throughout the code because it pushes that all the way out to the edge. One really cool thing about this, and I, I should say this is both a good thing and a bad thing, is then two years from now, I change that and I say it must be greater than or equal to one. How many places does this affect? My theorem prover comes through and it's like, here's 19,000 places that affects. Right. Oh, I might not want to make that change. Maybe it's time to design a new language for you. You ever thought about that? Well, I started working on a new language, but my, my language was very specific. And where is it now? I'd say it's about half done. Uh-huh. But like it, it, it has like a syntax, it actually compiles, but I want to change things with it. it, it it's related to those process managers I was discussing before in time, where you actually have time as an intrinsic part of the language. Mm -hmm. 
Do you think there is room in this world for new languages? And I mean popular languages, not something which we make for, for you know, for like a lab work or for fun, but really mainstream programming languages, which will eventually maybe replace Java or C++. Um, or we're done with that. We just stick to Java and forever. No. I think you've seen some interesting trends going on the last decade, one of which is people moving a lot more to functional. Right. And it continues. People move and move to functional programming. I know people who were object-oriented programmers and now they're functional and they say they will never come back. Well, and there's, there's two parts to this as well. So one part of it is that people started getting into functional programming. The other part of it is that people's languages that they were using started becoming more functional. C Sharp is a drastically different language today than it was 10 years ago. Or 15 years ago. Java is also now full of functional things, full of these uh, function expressions. The one of the funnest ones was when they introduced Link. Uh -huh. How often did you see people actually write Link statements versus how often did you see people write a bunch of for loops or for each loops and then ReSharper told them, would you like to make this into a Link statement? <laughs> But people say that functional programming is more difficult to understand for a junior programmer. And that's why it's only good for somebody who is old enough and mature enough to, to understand. And it's much easier to write procedures and objects and methods. So functional is not the mainstream paradigm and will never be. That's what I've heard. I, I don't believe that statement is true. Uh -huh. Instead, what I'm going to propose is that either would be roughly equivalent to learn as your first language. But once you've already learned procedural programming, then learning functional programming is a little bit more difficult. Uh -huh. In the same way that if you started off as a functional programmer and then you got into imperative code, you'd be like, oh boy, there's a bunch of stuff I need to learn here. <laughs> It, it, it's more where you started. Where did you start? What's your story? You, you don't want to know my first language. <laughs> what is it, assembly? I was working in two languages when I started. One was basic, the other was assembly. There you go. And Which, you, you can't go wrong with assembly. I mean, you, you'll, you'll definitely learn something if you spend some time to learn assembly. Yeah, so they scarred you for life? <laughs> these languages well, and you know I, I i was posting about this i'm trying to think if it's on twitter or not this is maybe a month or two ago so i can even tell you I, i'm 90 percent sure the first computer science book i ever bought it was mastering turbo assembler by tom swan <laughs> yeah i remember that language turbo assembler well, but it was it was cool. You could do so much stuff in it. Oh yeah. You can't do a lot of that stuff today. People don't learn that stuff now. Go around and ask modern programmers. They don't have no idea what assembly is. They have no idea what's the architecture of this of the hardware. Then they know they don't know what is the register inside CPU. They have no idea what is the, the bus inside the inside the computer. So, so I, I have a, a lot of People that, that sometimes I, I maybe once a year or so I'll put up on Twitter that oh I got my books and so every time that they're making changes to the Pentium chips you you can actually order the books from Intel about the changes in the processor and basically it's like it's like documentation at a machine and assembly level explaining to you how the processors have changed. Very, very few people order them, but they're free. Huh. 
I didn't know. They, they will literally send you out these books. Cool, I'll try. Interesting. So do people know to, do people have to know the architecture of a hardware? What's your opinion? Or maybe it's for system engineers and we just... It, it depends what kind of code you're writing. If you're writing a business system, no. If you would teach students, let's say, you have a class of students, they're all you know, 20 years old and you have to teach them computer science or software development, software design. Would you tell them about the architecture of the hardware? Most likely not, unless we are going to be doing something like working in embedded systems, in which case, absolutely, you need to know this. Oh yeah, that's for sure. But if they're like software developers going to design web services and uh, uh, whatever on the web, then no. There's there's probably still some knowledge that's needed, uh -huh. but it's drastically less knowledge. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you know, it's I... not something that you're going to run into on a weekly basis, but you might still run into it. So you should probably know at least some basics about the subject, but you don't need to know in depth. Now, if we we're gonna talk about a group of Java developers who are building an algorithmic trading system, I would give a very different answer. Mm -hmm. um, this is when you start getting into things like mechanical sympathy because, well, you have to. Right. Because Java took away this connection to hardware from us. In C and C++, we were quite connected. I remember that time when I switched from C++, from C++ actually to Java. In C++, you kind of felt the hardware. You know, there's memory, you allocate the memory. You can, any at any moment of time, you can write assembly language right next to your C code. But then we moved to Java and boom, that was like a completely different world. From now on, there's no computer there. It's just, uh, just, just objects, just methods, <laughs> variables, you know? So is it good or bad? That's, that's a big question for me. I still don't know because I see people around me who are like 15 years younger than me and they have no idea what's going on in the computer. All they know is like objects, frameworks, libraries, methods. Well, there's, there's a big benefit to this as well, which is I can go and write code on my laptop here and I can move it over to, let's say, a 68040. If it's written in something like, say, Java, I can just emulate it here on my laptop, and it works pretty much the same way as it's going to work on that 68040. Right. And for a vast number of systems, it is completely OK. <laughs> it, it's completely OK that. I can run it and it's going to run the same. Like, don't get me wrong, it might have some slightly different performance characteristics. It might have slightly different memory characteristics, but we don't care. Exactly. There's a big difference between that and trying to fit something into 32K of memory oh, yeah. on an embedded chip. Oh, yeah. So you're actually, you're looking into the future, it seems. So you, you're not being uh, uh, depressed about the situation that will lost the connection to the hardware. You think that future is about programmers thinking more uh, on a higher level, more conceptually. In general, yes. And I think we're going to find more and more things coming out to focus on productivity more than anything else. Because this is what most developers deal with as their main issue. It's not about how can I make this web page be able to serve 5,000 requests per second as when right now we cap out of 500. It's, I need to make these 27 web pages in the next 30 days. <laughs> right. And this productivity, I actually wanted to ask you about this. So many people, some people say that productivity is the elusive term. It's like a false objective that we shouldn't 
aim for productivity. We shouldn't even measure productivity. We should let programmers do what they do best. And then whatever comes out of their laboratories, then this is the result. So we should never push them to any goals, any metrics, any measurements. This is going to be completely team and organization based. Uh -huh. Some people do well with a whip cracking behind them. Other people, they, they do worse with a whip cracking behind them. What about you? Depends what I'm working on. Uh huh. There are some things I'll work on. It's just I don't. I don't even want to be working on this. Please make it stop. <laughs> so in some cases, actually, you know, measuring productivity for you may help you move faster. And in in other cases, it might make me move slower. Move slower. <laughs> there you go. The the one that you really have to worry about, though, and I've seen this in organization after organization after organization is where they say that we're going to measure productivity and we're going to use this standardized format to measure all of our productivity. And right. oddly, all the team members then optimize for the measurement of productivity, not for the creation of good software. Right. Now, these two things may or may not actually be aligned. It could be that I show up as a very, very productive developer in your metric. But what I'm, what I'm being productive at is producing a bunch of crap. Yeah. But if the metrics are designed well, if they are uh, actually uh, uh, preventing this from happening, people abusing the system, then it seems like it's possible to measure and programmers will be happy and their overall result will be bigger because of the metrics the, the only problem is is that what you're describing there is, is something that has yet to be found in anything resembling a generic fashion <laughs> right so, so now we, we we have all of these different places all creating their own little metric systems yeah and they're all wrong well and who created the metric it is actually a very important question. Do those metrics actually align in any way, shape, or form with what we actually want? Yeah. Let me let me just give a, a, a really obvious example here. So I'm going to make the metric for our organization lines of code per day. So now you end up putting in a thousand lines of code per day, but your code is utter crap. Yeah. Well, it's a lousy metric. Imagine another metric, how many bugs you fix per day. The bugs reported by clients. Oh, oh, I've seen this one in use. So what, what ends up happening is... They create bugs. They create bugs that are very simple right. to push them out so then they can go and fix them. See, we're too smart. People are smarter than metrics. And this is why metrics are hard to come up with. There are some metrics which are very, very good. As an example, uptime. Right, for example, exactly. Uptime is something that you can't really cheat on. You're well, either you, up or you're not. You can also cheat, you can remove the features. You can take off the features, the system becomes more stable because it's more simple and then uptime goes up. So if I, if I pay you for the uptime, you as a programmer will be very resistant on introducing new features. Every time I come to you with a new idea, you will be always pushing me back because you know that will hurt the uptime. So that's Correct. also a negative side. You know? But that's, that's actually a good pushback because I told you I valued the uptime. And now you're coming back to me going, no, 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 no. If I, if I start adding all these features, it, it's it's most likely going to negatively Im impact my uptime. Uh -huh. This is a good discussion. Yeah, you're right. So you think it's good in general for programmers to, pre to protect their scope and not let all the possible features get in, right? I think anyone who's ever worked in a production code base would say that. 
<laughs> we have all at some point received the most idiotic feature request that you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, right. Where it literally you are left scratching your head going, who would actually want that? <laughs> Like, I, I can't even come up with any reason why someone might want this. Yeah, good point. Even having talked to the user who does want it, I am still left without words as to why they actually want it. <laughs> well, I agree. Here, I definitely agree with you. I have one last question for you because we're running over time already. Um, what about your book? Because I actually ask a few people before starting this interview, a few of my followers, what kind of question I should ask you. And two people said, ask him about the book. Because they said the book was, this 90% of your book is very interesting. So when are you planning to finish it? Oh, so the versioning book. Yes, that's right. The, the, the versioning book is essentially done. Uh -huh. um, the work that needs to be done, on it, uh, I've talked to some varying places about it, is basically moving it to a physical form it's layout work it's like i even have all the art done and the art is actually really cool it's it's not currently up in the lean pub version when i was out in grand canaria i i hired a street artist cool uh and when i say street artist i don't mean like a graffiti artist i mean like one of the guys that um when you come down and you're on holiday with your wife He'll be like, hey, do you want me to draw a picture, like a caricature of you and your wife? And I, yeah. I gave him all the images, and he drew, like, caricatures out of all the images. How much did you pay? Oh, it was a couple hundred bucks. Oh, cool. Um, th this isn't a huge piece of work for him. I think there was something like 20 images for him to do. And it most of them are relatively simple, but he drew them up nicely, like, hand-drawn. Uh, and when, where are you going to publish it? It's going to be Lean Pub as well, electronic book, or are you uh, going to go for a publisher? I've talked with a couple publishers. And? It's a book that's in a weird market from a publisher perspective. Well, it it's weird because it's not really a book that you would ever want to put onto a shelf at, say, Barnes & Noble. Like, it's just such a niche topic. They told you that. Well, pretty much. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's not like if, if I were, and I, I started writing another book, which is about event sourcing in general, that book, they'd be like, yeah, sure. Like, we can throw that out on the, on the shelf at the bookstore. We can throw that up on Amazon. People will buy it, no problem. But a book about versioning, it's just very, very niche. Like, who's who's your target audience on that that would be walking through Barnes & Noble? Yeah, see, it's all about money. They care about mass market. So they want to sell, like, thousands of copies tomorrow. Right. And I've... I've gone through, I, I've done varying print layouts, things like that. What's most likely going to end up happening, I, I found a service that basically you do all the layout work with them. And then you can tell them, okay, I want to print up 300 of these. And then they offer that they will drop ship them to people. Mm -hmm. If that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it does. from their point of view. It's just much, much easier dealing with that than trying to deal with yeah. the book companies and everything that's going to be involved with it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I'm not faulting the book companies in any way. I mean, I, I understand their business model and where th there's not really alignment between the two. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It's not really their specialty. How much time did you spend on the book to write it? Oh, that's a good question. Well, uh, let's talk about calendar time first, and then your 
uh, work hours? You'd be surprised how little time was actually spent. Calendar wise or the, the effort? So calendar wise, there was quite a bit of time spent, but effort wise, not so much. Like not so much means what? Two days, two weeks, two months? Um, if I had compressed the time, probably like two weeks. That's cool. Because you knew what to write, like, right? You didn't need to do some research to, to prepare the materials. Right. And, and a lot of it was not the writing of things to start with. It was the, okay, let me send this off to five people and have them read it and see what they come back with. And uh, was there a section they don't like and maybe I should rewrite that section or... Mm -hmm. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it does. And how big is the book? How many pages right now? I'd have to go pull it up. It's not very long. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm asking these questions because some of the people who are listening to us right now, they may think about publishing a book as well. So we need to tell them your experience and then they may learn from you. So what would you, what would you tell them, the people who haven't yet started? With writing a book? It's going to depend a lot on your topic. The main thing to start with is trying to get a chapter layout and to get that kind of set. Uh -huh. So basically, it's kind of like building software. The first thing I want to start with is what is a rough idea of my overall goal? And then to move forward from there. Mm -hmm. Which is hard to do, I imagine. That's why you're emphasizing that. Well, and it's hard to stick to it, if that kind of makes sense. It means that you you have some initial idea in the beginning, and then in a few chapters down the road, you change everything, right? Well, yeah, and then it's, well, I, now I need to rewrite chapters two and three. Uh. And I, I, I've done this myself, and I've watched lots of other people do it, where you start getting into this thing of, I am no longer really creating new content i'm just rewriting the content that i already have in slightly different ways yeah that's, does that kind of make sense that's lame yeah it's, it's not a happy experience i can imagine well maybe for some people it isn't a good experience like the, the whole process of writing could be enjoying but uh the, when the result is disappearing every every second month the the other thing that i would tell people in terms of writing, especially for things like computer science. And, and I've learned this over time, is to try to get as many personal examples of things into the text as possible. Okay. So it's not just, uh, it, if I tell you, if you do this, you're going to end up failing. Tell me the story about how you did it and you failed. Yeah. Because that story, especially if it's a good one, is something that's going to stay in my mind. Mm -hmm. And it, it builds up your authenticity. Mm -hmm. That it's, it's not just that I'm telling you, don't do this. I'm telling you, don't do this because I did it and here's where I fucked up. And in your book, you told them these stories. Yes, and that, that's a big part of what I was trying to get into the book was not just that this is how you should do things, but it, it's also, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not some magician over here who just came up with all this stuff. Here's where I didn't do these things and I really screwed up and this is what you're trying to avoid.
Good. I think that's a that's a smart smart advice to people who, because yeah, I know. I mean, many books are pretty abstract and they say very good things about things in general, but they don't go down to examples, and that's why they're boring to read. I totally agree. Well, and honestly, there's a lot that we can learn from failures. And actually seeing what failed, why it failed, retrospective back on the failure is a very, very good way of learning why you should avoid that failure in the future. Yeah. Well, and how to avoid that failure in the future. Okay, that's quite positive, I believe. Quite positive finish of the story, of the of the talk. <laughs> I uh, keep... Oh training. my God, where'd he go? Sorry, 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 hold on. <laughs> this camera is annoying. So thank you very much for coming for the interview. I really enjoyed talking to you and I really hope to see you sometime next time, maybe in the future. Wow, you mean like once flights are going again? And... Mm, yes, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think we're getting pretty close to it at this point. Yeah, I also hope so. Within the next few months i think you're going to start seeing a lot of things opening up i also hope so honestly because it's annoying what's going on now well i i just want to be able to jump on a plane to london land in london go work jump on a plane out of london where are you right now by the way i didn't ask you i am near new york city all right okay okay thanks for the talk greg let me i'll let you go thanks for your yeah. time Enjoy. Absolutely, you too. All, All right. right. Bye.